Hello, everyone, and uh, my name is Mike Jenko. I'm here with Chris Maples, and uh, we are going to talk about rapid sequence intubation. And uh, this came about, I was actually talking to, um, golly, who was I talking to? Someone that you Britt. were talking to. I was talking to Britt, and I was talking to Lauren. Yeah, Britt and Lauren. Um, and that, this is probably uh, three or four weeks back now, and they had commented that with all the new staff that they've had, that um, some of the staff weren't familiar with uh, rapid sequence intubation, and um, they were, you know, a little concerned because they didn't want any kind of, you know, bad outcomes or anything from from staff not being familiar, and uh, had gotten a copy, a, a paper copy of a PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint. I guess, lecture about uh, rapid sequence intubation and the, the induction sequence and such. Um, but I thought, you know, that's good and you can look at stuff, but I thought it might be better if, uh, if Chris and I went through some of this. And so um, we put this together. It's uh, hopefully going to be real brief. Uh, just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a, a basic knowledge about rapid sequence intubation and then also uh, give you a little bit of an idea of what goes through our minds, the physicians' minds, when we're in this situation and what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, my thought was that if you guys understand where we're coming from, I think some of the stuff that we do will make a little bit more sense. Uh, well, maybe in your case, Mike. Um but, you know, this is an exa example of one of those um, things we do in the ER where a lot happens in a very short period of time. And it, it almost seems uh, uh, rote. You know, we do it fairly frequently mm -hmm. and fairly often. It seems like we're just going through the motions. But, you know, in a good RSI, there's a lot of pre-consideration and um, uh, concern about what the next step is while you're doing the, the step prior yeah, to it. Absolutely. So um, first to talk about... Uh, you know, give you a little bit of background. Uh, rapid sequence intubation basically involves uh, pre-oxygenation, which is a key step uh, to this process, and then administering a potent induction agent, usually atomidate or ketamine or propofol or one of those type agents, immediately followed by paralytic, and then uh, our goal is to get the patient intubated with as little uh, use of a uh, bag valve mask uh, ventilation as possible. And uh, this is something that I think, you know, historically that's the goal. I think that that doesn't happen all the time uh, because of uh, some inherent difficulties with uh, the ED population. But ultimately that's the goal. Anytime we do this is to get them intubated, get them induced, paralyzed, and intubated before they drop their SATs without having to bag them. Yeah, I mean, that's the ideal situation. Right. So indications and contraindications, there actually aren't a whole lot of hard and fast contraindications. There are some relative ones if you think somebody is going to have a difficult intubation because of anatomy. Uh, but even in those cases, if you're comfortable with your surgical airway skills, if the attending is comfortable with their surgical airway skills, you can even use it in those, uh, in those cases. Um, and it's going to be the method of choice in the vast majority of people that we see in the emergency department. So when we talk about rapid sequence intubation, we talk about the seven P's. That's preparation, pre-oxygenation, pre-treatment, paralysis, positioning, placement, and then post-intubation management. And uh, I would uh, pose that the most important of those P's is probably your preparation step. Yeah, um, definitely. And then uh, followed closely by your pre-oxygenation. So in preparation, what are we talking about? Um, again, I think it's the key to a successful intubation. Uh, the physician is always going to assess the patient to determine uh, whether they think they could be a difficult airway or not. And there's a, a number of things that we look at to assess that. I'm not going to go into those uh, now. Uh, but if we think it's going to be a difficult intubation, then uh, we may, uh, you know, modify the RSI uh, you know, the RSI pathway a little bit. Um, we obviously want to have the patient in a place where they can be uh, managed appropriately. So frequently that means bringing them up to, uh, to one of the resuscitation bays. You want to get the patient on oxygen as soon as possible and get them hooked up to the monitoring equipment. Um, in my opinion, that includes the end tidal uh, CO2 monitor. Um, adjusting the bed and making sure that you have the patient in the bed correctly is uh, very important. Um, that is particularly important when you're talking about the large patients, um, the patients where uh, because of uh, obesity they may be uh, more of a difficult intubation. And I've got a picture to show you later on to, uh, to demonstrate how ideally they should be positioned. Um, two IVs if at all possible. 
you want to choose your drugs and bring those to the bedside. You want to make sure your laryngoscope or your stores or whatever you're going to use is set up and, and that you have a backup blade if uh, need be. You want to get your tube prepped, check the balloon, make sure you have a backup tube. I usually like to pick uh, you know, the tube I think I'm going to use and then I take one size smaller in case they have a tight, uh, tight airway. Obviously you want to make sure you have suction set up and then even though ideally you're not going to use it, you do want to have your bag valve mask ready uh, and available. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think if you think about the uh, uh, RSIs that you've seen that have gone well versus the ones that have seemed a little bit, um, you know, see to your pants, <laughs> it's, <clears throat> it's the preparation step. Right. You know, I mean, the ones that go well, even when the two doesn't go in initially, there's, there's, you know, choice B and choice C all lined up. Sometimes we don't have the luxury of preparation, so those are right. always a little bit um, uh, sphincter tightening. But in general, um, these, you know, when you look at the bedside and you look at what's what's going to happen, um, these are the things you want to look for. I mean, it means the person doing the intubation is prepared. Right, right. And then I didn't, Chris mentioned it, I didn't mention it, but plan B and plan C is always important. And if plan B or plan C involves special equipment, you want to make sure you have that out and ready before you um, start. So that would be part of the preparation but step as Really well. a lot of talk for what is really a probably minute to 30 second kind of thing to collect everything and, right. uh, uh, you know, just make sure everything's at the bedside. Yeah, absolutely. So the next step is pre-oxygenation, and this is um, something that in an ideal situation works very, very well. Unfortunately, in many of our situations, we, we can't do this. So um, what you're trying to do with pre-oxygenation is create a large oxygen reservoir in the lung, uh, in the body, in the tissue, uh, tissues of the body. Um, you know, ideally, you're going to give them three minutes at 100% O2. Now, 100% O2 in the emergency department is actually a little bit of a uh, ideal state. In, real in reality, when we put somebody on a face mask at 100%, they're really only getting 60 to 70% uh, oxygen. Um, so take that three minutes, and now you make it four or five minutes uh, of what you need. Um, there is a way to shorten that time. If you have the patient take basically eight of the deepest breaths they can take, that will also get you that, um, that oxygen reservoir. And again, your goal with this is to have a reservoir of oxygen that your body can use while you're uh, inducing the patient, paralyzing them, and then getting them intubated. Um, now, in reality, again, think about some of the airways that we do in the emergency department. If you have somebody with an inner cerebral hemorrhage who is, um, you know, they're not conscious and they're being intubated for airway protection, you know, they can't really take eight deep vital capacity breaths. They don't have the ability to do so. And we can't administer 100% face mask oxygen on them. And so you can put the face mask on and give them 60 to 70% and then, you know, keep that on for five or 10 minutes. But do you really have that true oxygen reservoir? Maybe not. And so in those cases, you might actually bag them. A right, little bit. right. And you might see some assisted bagging. And I will right. add two things to this. The first is that um, there's a lot of people now that are using high flow nasal cannula in addition to right. the face mask, and some even even sometimes the respiratory techs are a little confused by this. And the idea is that you're just pumping more O2 in the yeah. lungs that they don't have to passively inhale while, because you can keep that on while you're intubating. Them. Yeah, and and many of us will actually do that, and that's been shown to help prolong that time. And there's hypoxia. really no that's contraindication it. to that. So as from a nursing standpoint, you can just throw that on. I mean, just put it on. If the if the doc doesn't want to run it at high flow, that's fine. But there's really no downside to it at all. Right. And the second thing is you may see docs, and especially in really sick patients that may desat quickly, throw on um, some BiPAP prior to intubation. So instead of bagging them, you BiPAP them for a little while mm -hmm. um, at 100%. That's a, that's, yep. And that's uh, another nice way to do it. So again, there's the ideal state that we would love to attain, and then there's the reality, reality state, yeah. uh, unfortunately. In like, stuff, for so. instance, um, the, the difference between my ideal state and my reality. Yes, there is quite a quite a quite wide a, gap there. Quite a so, chasm. Yes, it's embarrassing. Chasm is probably a better word for it. That, that was mean. So, uh, following up on that uh, that pre oxygenation stage, this is just to kind of give you an idea of if you uh, allow somebody to develop this reservoir and the studies they've done. Uh, how long does it take for someone to desaturate below 90%? This and always blows my mind when I see these. Historically, the teaching has been when you do an RSI, you should hold your breath. And when you feel like you need to take a breath, that's when the patient needs to take a breath. 
the reality is that's not exactly true, and it makes the doctors hypoxic, and we don't <laughs> make good decisions when we're hypoxic. So um, within a healthy 70-kilo adult, the time to desaturation, if they have a full oxygen reservoir in their body, is eight minutes. Now, unfortunately, we don't see many healthy 70-kilo adults that need to be emergently intubated. Um, what we tend to see is more uh, sick adults. Um, and if you add in comorbidities, that eight minutes rapidly goes to four minutes to three minutes. Um, obesity is another one that tends to shorten your time to desaturation. And if you have somebody who is more than 127 kilos, which I think is the clinical definition of obesity, um, that time, eight minutes goes down to three minutes or less. And it's the same thing for kids. Kids desaturate much quicker than adults do. Now, the time to desaturate from 90% to 0% is much, much shorter than the time from 100 to 90. And I'm not sure who volunteered for these studies, <laughs> but 90 to 0% is only two minutes, and that's in a healthy adult. So you can imagine how quick it can be in a, a obese adult, in a sick adult, and a kid. So uh, again, this is just to provide a little framework for you guys to understand. You know, again, this is sort of what's going through our minds. This is why we're um, why we're trying to do things, and why when you can't get somebody intubated, we rapidly bag them, and why we really want to try to get them back up to a hundred or the high nineties before we try again. Right, and and why we don't get too excited when we are hanging around at ninety one or ninety two percent if it's not trending yet, because right. we know we can hold that for a little while, but. Right. You get into 85, we start to get a little bit more excited. And those are the numbers we need to know. We don't need to know that they're still 95%. We need to know that they're now, you know, descending. Right. So pre-treatment, um, largely you want to uh, try to minimize the uh, effect that uh, or the irritation that you'll cause when you actually do the uh, laryngoscopy, uh, when you manipulate the airway. And so um, having something, you know, having a laryngoscope stuck down your throat is kind of an irritating thing uh, for most people and uh, can cause the body to, uh, to react in ways that we maybe don't want it to. Um, historically, we've used a lot of different medicines for this. Uh, in the last five or ten years, we've really cleaned that up. And really the only two things we use now are lidocaine and fentanyl. And uh, we use them in very specific situations, and uh, the mnemonic that we have is the ABC mnemonic for those uh, two things. So you're talking about asthma, you're talking about brain pathology, and you're talking about cardiovascular pathology. And when you have somebody with asthma, oftentimes we'll use lidocaine to try to decrease the amount of uh, spasm that will cause uh, when intubating somebody. Uh, when you have somebody with uh, a sort of marginal cardiovascular status, we'll use the fentanyl to try and uh, mitigate any sort of hemodynamic uh, effects that we'll have from manipulating their airway. And then you'll see us use both lidocaine and fentanyl in folks who have brain pathology, classically the inner cerebral hemorrhage that we're intubating for airway protection. And so when we call for those medicines, that's usually why we're calling for them. Now, to be honest with you, using the lidocaine and fentanyl, pre-treating somebody who doesn't fall into one of these three categories isn't going to cause any problems in most cases. So you may see it used in uh, clinical situations outside of these three. But again, we like to use them in these three specifically, and that's why so that we don't uh, cause the, uh, the um, physiologic response that you see when you manipulate someone's airway. So then we get to uh, paralysis and induction. And um, what we want to do is rapidly induce unconsciousness in the uh, patient and then uh, uh, rapidly uh, paralyze them. So we use several different drugs for induction. Uh, these, again, have changed a little bit over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I think. Um, generally, we want to push them pretty rapidly, and you're going to expect apnea usually within uh, less than a minute. Um, and, and again, the, um, it's important to note that the um, induction phase, the uh, in, induction of unconsciousness is prior to the induction, induction of paralysis. Yeah, I probably should have flip-flopped that, uh, that slide heading. But, yeah, just, you know, people don't like to be paralyzed before they're unconscious. It kind of no. blows them kind of an uncomfortable situation. <laughs> yeah, it's not a lot Although of there are some historical stories of people intending to do that for some of our yeah, but we like, I like penalty to, tubes. I like to think we're a kinder, gentler ED now. So, anyways, induction drugs. So, uh, probably the three that you'll see most commonly, and to be honest, you probably only see the top two most commonly, is uh, Atomidate, Ketamine, and Propofol. Atomidate, I think, is by far the one that's used the most. 
Um, it's generally very well tolerated. It uh, hemodynamically has very little effect on the uh, system. You may sometimes see when you induce somebody, you may see uh, a, some myoclonic jerking. It almost. Uh, I've had what, a what, wait, what did you just call me? <laughs> Do you, you my, I called why, you myoclonic. Why, why does it have to be like that? Yeah. I have had some patients where it's been fairly prominent and it actually has looked almost like they've had a seizure. It's not a seizure. It's just it's just a little bit of uh, muscle jerking. Um, in patients who are septic, there has been a little bit of a move away from Atomidate because possibly effects on cortisol. Um, that has been more theoretical than real. Uh, a lot of the studies um, that show this, actually it's in patients where Atomidate has been used in the ICU to keep them sedated. Um, not so much at the induction doses that we use uh, in the emergency department. Now, ketamine is another one that we use. It has a very nice uh, effect on, uh, on the lungs in that it produces bronchodilatation. So if you have somebody with asthma who's being intubated, oftentimes we'll use ketamine instead of Atomidate. Um, it is also fairly good in sepsis because it will stimulate a little bit of a catecholamine release, which will help with the blood pressure. Um, it can produce a laryngospasm. But if you're paralyzing the patient right after you give them the ketamine, that shouldn't be as big of an issue. Uh, and then propofol is the third one. Obviously, if they're hemodynamically unstable, we don't want to use that. But again, I don't think I've, I think maybe I've used it once or twice to induce people in 15 years. It's very uncommon. So Yeah, because these, you know, these people that we're, that we're intubating are kind of unstable. And right. Propofol is, can add a little bit of unpredictability to the right. mix. I well, mean, and, and I think most of you have probably used propofol to sedate them after the right. intubation. And that's, you know that sometimes their blood pressure drops, and then we have to shut it off, and then you have to give them Versed or, you know, whatever. Um, so we probably don't use it as much. I think, uh, you know, if you pulled the ED docs, I would say that the most comfort they have is with Atomidate, and then ketamine is probably second. So, um, so those are the induction drugs, and those are why we choose what we choose. Um, for the paralytics that we use, um, succinylcholine, I think, remains kind of the go-to drug for most of the emergency department physicians, although you're starting to see ROC uh, come into uh, more widespread use. Um, the big thing with the succinylcholine is if you have anybody who is going to be prone to malignant hyperthermia or hyperkalemia, then you probably want to stay away from them. Um, and hyperkalemia is not just the patients who are uh, dialyzed, but it's the patients who actually have muscle diseases that um, could make them prone to a rapid release of, uh, of potassium. And this comes from the way the succinyl uh, interacts with the uh, nervous system uh, in those large muscle groups. And it's kind of a complicated explanation that you guys probably don't really need to... I don't. I, I, I'm of. not interested in any. Yeah. Please don't. So, That's, but if we choose, if somebody uses rock over socks, it may be because they're worried about hyperkalemia, or it may be just because they're more comfortable with the rock. And honestly, this is somewhat of a generational thing. I think some of the um, older uh, ED docs, Mike Jenko, um, yeah, uh, I'm have, more, grew up with much more comfortable with socks than I am with rock. And some of the younger ones, uh, Chris Maples. Uh, uh, trained in more on rock, and so I would like in, to say though I'm getting more comfortable with rock. I've been it's using good. it. Uh, that's good. That'll keep yeah. your mind limber. Yeah, for your elder. Yeah. I need a limber mind. Years. I'm getting senile here. So, uh, so those are the paralytics, and again, why we choose what we what we choose and how you do them. Um, positioning is something that, uh, to be honest, I do that as part of the. Um, prepare and pre-treatment phase, but then also uh, after you've pushed your paralytic, you want to make sure that you've got them in an ideal position uh, for, you know, for intubation. A lot of this is going to depend on body habitus. Classically, we've been taught that the sniffing position is what lines up your airway real well, and I think that this, uh, this cartoon here shows, I think, gives you an idea of why we choose that position. In our uh, larger patients, we want to try and achieve a uh, uh, a situation where we line up their ear to their sternal notch, and that helps line up the airway for our bigger patients. And you'd be surprised at what type of positioning to get, especially some of the bigger patients. How you know how much effort can go into positioning just to, and you'll see in this next picture, 
to achieve that. It isn't right. this guy. This is a nice picture here, but it's you know kind of like one <laughs> little pillow, person, yeah. and that's an, you mean and you get and that once a year. Maybe. You know, there's a lot of material sometimes that goes into getting right. him this position, but oftentimes it's the it's the difference between a successful intubation and one that you uh, are struggling with. Now, classically, we've been taught to do Selix maneuver, which is where you uh, you basically put pressure on their uh, their larynx to try and include their esophagus so that they don't vomit. The, uh, the research on that has actually shown that uh, in some cases that makes it more difficult to get your uh, patient intubated and uh, may not actually decrease the, um, the chance of aspiration. And so that has been moved to sort of a, an, optional, uh, an optional part of the procedure, and, and I don't think many people are actually doing it nowadays. Uh, however, if you do have somebody with an anterior airway or you have somebody whose airway is uh, maybe deviated a little bit to the left or the right, you may see the doctor try to manipulate it a little bit with their free hand. Um, and if they get it, get that airway in a, in a position where they can see it real well, they may ask somebody at the bedside to hold it in that position while they intubate the patient. And so if, they, if you see that, that's why they're doing that. This is the photo that Chris referenced. This is uh, probably, I think, more representative of uh, the patients that we intubate at this point. And you can see here how we, they've lined up uh, her ear, I think it's a her, ear to the, uh, to the sternal notch. But then look at the blankets underneath uh, the shoulders and the head. And that's called ramping. And um, you may see that, uh, or we may ask you to do that when we intubate in the emergency department. And again, what we're trying to do is line up the airway. Uh, yeah, so and this is this is a nice. This is hard to achieve. I it mean, is, it yeah. really is. Um, I think this is actually a picture from the OR, and that's why it yeah. was done so nicely. Uh, but uh, you know, this position in and of itself, it's worth the time. I know it seems like we're just kind of you know screwing around with towels and pillows and trying to make ourselves comfortable, but really, what we're trying to achieve is uh, you know first pass. A first right. pass tube, because right. we know that if you don't get the first one, then more, more morbidity or, or complications of the RSI procedure go way up. Right. And remember, um, in, in these patients, you've got a shorter time to desaturation. Even if you are able to get them adequately oxygenated before you start, you've only got about three or four minutes, and then you know once right. you hit that ninety percent, you have you know seconds. So worth the time. So it, it's definitely worth it to do this if you if you have the chance to. Uh, and then, uh, and then comes uh, placement. So when we intubate somebody, we're trying to visualize the cords. Uh, we want to watch the tube actually going through the cords. That's the uh, most reliable way to uh, prove that you've uh, that you've intubated the patient uh, correctly. Uh, because we have gotten so comfortable using the stores, many of the people at the bedside will actually be able to watch us while we do this, and uh, and that obviously is, uh, I think, again, I don't think the research is demonstrated conclusively that it's better than direct learning. Oh, totally better. But totally better. <laughs> it on. feels better. It's, it's way better. <laughs> if, uh, if you're unable to pass the, patient, pass the uh, tube and the patient's becoming hypoxic, that, that's going to be the situation where we start to bag them. And, um, and that doesn't mean that we failed or anything like that. It just means we want to keep their SATs up. Uh, and then you want to confirm placement afterwards, uh, end tidal CO2, um, you've got the capnography that uh, changes color, um, you've got uh, auscultation, and all those things I think are valid ways to confirm that you've placed uh, that you've placed the tube. And many times we'll do more than one, like we may get a color change, we may get the, the auscultation in, and, and then we'll call for our chest x-ray. Post-intubation management, you want to make sure you secure the tube. Um, I was taught to never let go of the tube until it's actually secure, and so you may see the doctors actually holding the tube while they're managing the patient after intubation. Sometimes respiratory will take over for us and hold the tube, but again, you don't want to, especially if it was a difficult intubation, you don't want to do anything to allow that tube to come out. Now, Mike, I, after intubation, will hold the... Um blade the laryngoscope blade up and drop it like a microphone and walk out that's <laughs> the, the maples mic drop I yeah that. okay. that's how i do it okay well i'm uh, i'm sure <laughs> i don't even have anything to say about that. <laughs> yeah, you don't yeah. have anything to say about that. <laughs> Uh, and then obviously you want to set your vent rates. Um, our RTs are really strong here, and so we, we oftentimes will defer to their uh, to their judgment on that. Um, we'll call for a chest X-ray for placement, 
it's not uncommon for patients to become hypotensive uh, because you're getting them intubated and there's going to be better ventilation. You're going to increase their thoracic pressure. That's going to diminish venous return, so it may be uh, transient. That usually responds to a fluid bolus. So if we call for fluid immediately after we intubate, that's why. And then obviously you want to uh, to <coughs> initiate sedation, and there's all sorts of ways you can do that. that yeah, that, that post-intubation um, blood pressure is super important because oftentimes you'll see, you'll be real surprised. You repeat the blood pressure, and it's now you know 60. half of what it was. Right, uh, and you're like, uh, "What did I just do?" Yeah, yeah. So, but that that's the most common reason why that happens. Uh, timing on RSI again. Chris mentioned it before. This is a, a lot of talk for you know ten minutes or fifteen minutes, not even fifteen minutes worth of uh, activity. Um, but the timing, if it, if everything goes as planned, would be you know uh, ten minutes before you want to pass the tube or before you want to induce them. You're going to prepare five minutes. You're going to start pre-oxygenating. You're not going to hurt anything if you start pre-oxygenating at 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour. Or whenever you recognize they're going to need to be intubated, you want to get oxygen on them. Uh, any pretreatment usually is done uh, about three minutes beforehand. Uh, and then at zero minutes, you're going to uh, induce them and then paralyze them. Uh, about 20 to 30 seconds of positioning. Uh, hopefully, it'll only take you 15 to 20 seconds to actually get placement and prove that it's there, and then you're going to start post-intubation management immediately. So that's, uh, I think, kind of a look at, at how things would run in an, yeah, ideal, in, in an ideal world. So, uh, so final thoughts. Uh, you know, all the studies have shown that RSI in the emergency department has a very high success rate, well into the 90s. There's a very low complication rate. Um, you do need to be careful if you think somebody is going to have a uh, difficult airway, but you need to be careful with that at any time. And uh, if you have confidence in your, you know, if the physician has confidence in, in their backup plans, then you may still see them use uh, RSI even in the difficult uh, airways. Um, and that's pretty much everything. Hopefully that provided an insight into what kind of goes through our minds when we're uh, getting someone uh, ready for RSI and when we're doing the RSI. Um, obviously, if you guys have questions, we're happy to try and answer them. I hope that this has been helpful for everybody. Yeah, I think my so. take-home points would be um, how much, uh, how, how worth it the preparation step is, including the pre-oxygenization and the positioning. And then um, the order of the drugs, uh, uh, sedation before paralysis, yeah. So the automidate or the uh, ketamine before the rock or the vec or the succinylcholine. And then um, kind of making sh just confirming that you had success. And if you didn't, having a backup plan. Yeah. So uh, like I said, if you guys have questions or comments, feel free to, to shoot Chris or myself an email or uh you know, give us a call or catch us one day when we're working. And uh, if you guys like this and you want to hear other topics, just let us know. We're happy to talk about other stuff. Oh, I'm always so, happy to hear myself talk. Yeah, Chris loves talking. So I'm a talker. All right, till next time, guys.